Happy New Year's Eve. It's almost 2022, but this is the last pot of 2021. Thank you so much for making Lockdown Mavs just a, a, such a staple uh, for a lot of you guys and for making it your first listen. Today's episode is brought to you by Prize Picks. Check out prizepicks.com. Use the promo code NBA or go to our app store. Download the app today. Prize Picks is daily fantasy made easy. Guys, today I have Tim Cato, the athletic friend of the pod, friend in real life. We're talking everything about the Mavs roster, trade deadline stuff. It's a good pod. It's a good pod to end the year. Coming up. And this is Locked On Mavericks Podcast. We don't believe you shouldn't be here. Welcome to Lockdown Mavs. This is one of your co-hosts, Isaac Harris, contributing Mavs.com. Joined it, joined, joined it, joined by the bearded wonder, Tim Cato, all the way from Sacramento. What what do you have to report on from, from Sacramento as far as the city? Well, uh, there's apparently an otter family uh, in the river here. I was told that at breakfast, so I need to be keeping an eye out for them. It's cold, but not as cold as Salt Lake City and Portland, which is the two places I was previously, which coincidentally was also where the Mavericks were. You know, kind of Ooh. funny how that happens. <laughs> and yeah, man, I'm I'm just here. I'm just here in this weird... Honestly, Isaac, so the week between Christmas and New Year's, it always feels like it's out of... Like it exists outside of time and space, right? Yeah. Like everything goes. And to be traveling this week as well, to be changing time zones, to be in three different cities in, I think, five days at this point, I, I, I barely feel like I exist in a real universe. It's been, it's been, uh, it's been odd. It's been an, a, an odd trip in, in that sense. But it's fun, man. Salt it's fun. I, I, got to, I got to see a couple games and got another one tonight. So, Out of the three cities, Salt Lake City, Portland, Sacramento, if you had to live in one, which one would it be? Oh, easily Portland. That that's that's okay. not a hard question at all. <laughs> Honestly, I hope the rest of the questions are harder because that 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 was that was that was not even close. Not even so. close. Okay, well, we're gonna talk about the Mavs roster, just everything about it. Uh, the hardship Mavs, as some have coined them, uh, just this current team. Um, the whole roster basically just like, hey, we're in trade season now. We're what six weeks away, something like that, from the trade deadline. I have some just random questions to throw at you. What do you think of the roster, what you've been seeing? So let's just stay there. These hardship Mavs, we've had some cool story. Brandon Knight, unfortunately, he's not playing. Uh, this pod is actually, actually coming out after the Kings game, so he wasn't able to play in the Kings game. Um, but we have Marquis Chris, Theo Pinson, handful of other guys. Basically, just I just want to open it up. Like, what have you seen from this team? I read your story on Christmas Day, read your story, uh, I guess it was a couple days afterwards. And so I know a, a gist of kind of what you feel about it, but what what can we take away from this Mavericks team over the past two weeks? I think, well, let's, let's just go big picture first. Let's do it. Um, I mean, you said you read my Christmas article, and, and I think that's that's the one where I I, I really started realizing – in my view, collectively, that the player is missing. And in some ways, it starts with Luca, yeah. Um, which is, but, but you know, more importantly, or, or as importantly, it's, it's Maxi and it's Tim Hardaway Jr. and Reggie Bullock. These four players, I think, you know, first off, make up a bulk of the, the minutes and the rotation when everybody's healthy. That's like four of your top eight players, or they happen. Yeah. And I, I think I am starting to see just how they're very geared to a heliocentric Luca style and how they are not, you know, if, if Jason Kidd came in and, and, you know, the very first quote of his that got attention was that Luca needs to trust his teammates more. And the entire season I've been like, trust his teammates for what? Like, like yeah. what are his teammates going to do if he's not passing them the ball for them to catch and shoot a three pointer? And you know, I, I guess I assumed or figured that 
that was pretty much the entire roster. And, and I still think to some extent it, it is. But what we've seen over the past few games, um, again, st- staying really big picture and thinking less about the players who are in and more about the players who are out, is that all of these players are very limited in their offensive abilities to progress the ball. Like, you know, Hardaway is obviously a, you know, he's a talented offensive player. It's, it's weird to describe him as limited, but he's not going to be making passes that really further the offense, you know, even in a way that Dorian Finney Smith can, I mean, Dorian over the past few games has been making surprising numbers of, of really smooth to interior bigs. I, I feel like, uh, and that's a part of his game that's grown. And from Maxi, you're not going to get that from Hardaway. You're not going to get that from Balak. And when you combine that with Luca, who is incredible, otherworldly, uh, magician, uh, magical, but you also combine it with you know all of the conditioning things that we've talked about and the lingering ankle injury and just the idea that you know he doesn't really move off the ball, that mm. he plays one style. Even as like, you know, the worst moments for the Mavs offense have come from Luca trying to play his old style and Chris stops trying to play this new style where he is allowed to post up. And I know you guys have talked about this. I know everybody has talked about this, about Luca driving into a posting Chris stops. And <laughs> yeah. I think, yeah, I mean, like there's a lot of good arguments that for using Chris stops in that way, right? Like he's had a great season statistically, um, but it can't fully coexist you got to find a balance between the two and and i think those four players all being out obviously the circumstances are not ideal and i hope none of them are dealing with symptoms but removing all four of those at once and, and really i think even if you remove maxi and, and and tim and and reggie and luca was just the guy who was you know if luca was was playing throughout this i think we'd probably have seen a little bit of change as well but i, I think just collectively we're seeing the style mismatch that that has kind of permeated throughout the offense for really the entire season. And I, 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 of course, it's more complicated than that. Of course, there's other factors going on. But in a very big picture sense, that's what I've seen from the roster changes in the sense of who's absent. Um, and, and then we can get more into like the specific income, incoming players and who might stick around and why they probably all won't stick around. Um, but that 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 was uh, something that I think I've been seeing for several games now, and really, really, it, I feel like it became more clear uh, against Portland. Yeah, I feel like they hit kind of you know obviously Portland had their own struggles and you know Damian questionable, and they had their own handful of players being out, but it felt like that was such a fun game, one to watch as a fan, but also it felt like everybody on the floor was having fun too including Josh Green, which it's like, man, I don't even know. I still don't know what, what the Mavs have in Josh Green. But when he's out there and, you know, he's dishing out these passes, you can't help to get excited about it. And it's like, man, is he like, is he the second best passer on the team? Or, But but when you look at the role players on the team, and let's just look at the hardship guys too. Marquise Chris, Brandon Knight, Theo Pinson, all the other guys, Charlie Brown playing on Christmas. Let's write the story about it. How how many of those guys do you think have a shot at sticking around, if any of them? I think I think it's Knight and Pinson that that stand out to me. And I'm curious about Pinson. I, I feel like we should be having news coming on him soon. You know, maybe by the time people listen to this podcast, there's there's news because I believe his 10 day runs out today or, or maybe tomorrow. Has to be um, soon. Yeah, yeah. I mean he was signed on he was signed Sunday, uh possibly Monday. And so he's he's coming up on a on a decision that needs to be made. And I don't know exactly how the 10 days work. Obviously, the team just lost Boban as well. So that opens up a, an additional s- slot. Do you get replacement contracts for replacement <laughs> players that go into <laughs> health and safety? I, I think that's the reason Isaiah uh, Thomas just got signed because he's replacing Brandon Knight. Um, anyway, for you know, we're recording too far ahead to to talk deep in, into that. But I, I think that. What I've seen from Knight is interesting um, in, in two ways. Uh, first, he can actually beat players with speed off the dribble. There, there really isn't someone who can do that on the roster. The closest you get is Trey Burke. And we all know that Trey Burke is essentially on the outs. He's been okay this season, but he's still, uh, I looked it up earlier. He's, he's a 53% true shooting guy. Mm-hmm. You know, he is a, he is an offensive 
spark plug who is not that efficient at he doesn't play defense nearly enough to you know for that to be anything that sticks him uh keeps him on the floor uh i, I think that there is room for a spark plug guard that makes a little bit more sense for this roster and has a skill set that that you know doesn't duplicate the other players on the roster um and, and i think knight could potentially be that uh which yeah, it makes the health and safety protocols and, and him engineering that very unfortunate. But but I've, I've seen that. Uh, the other thing is that Jason Kidd had an interesting quote after the game against Portland where he said that if you look at the team or if you, if you were in the locker room earlier this season, these guys are kind of a quiet bunch. And I guess if you think about them, that, that does kind of make sense. And Brandon Knight walks in after playing Portland and... Uh, PR had decided he was going to be one of the guys interviewed. And I thought that was a great idea. He played well. And he walks into that room and the very first thing is, is he's like, oh, you're media. What's up? How are you doing? How was your holidays? How was your Christmas? Like this is a bubbly, enthusiastic dude. And if you listen to his whole uh, press conference, once, once the camera started rolling, I think you pick up on that too. And that's something that, you know, I, I guess if, if you kind of go through the, the roster, they don't have a ton of that. And especially not from vets, um, you know, Boban a little bit, but he doesn't really do it in that way. So, you know, Brandon Knight is someone who played under kid. He credited kid throughout the uh, interview um, with progression as a player uh, and, and kids ability to, to help him see the floor better and become more of a full point guard. And all of those things come add up to a player that I think would be useful to stick around on this roster. Um, if, if you could open up a, a roster spot for him to take. Uh, Pinson, I think, makes sense because um, I had this wrong at first, but but he is actually eligible to be a two-way guy. And hmm. I, I think at this exact moment, uh, probably what the Mavs would want to do is just resign him to another 10-day and, and see. But he could be a two-way guy, and they do have a spot open. You know, that's the one roster spot they have open is a is a two way spot because Eugene uh, Amarui uh, had a had had a season injury ending surgery, I think, to his ankle. And because he's able to do that, you know, he would have to say yes as well. And maybe there's interest from other teams. Maybe he thinks he can go get another 10 day and work his way to a full roster spot. Um, and, and that's why I think another 10 day to to Theo is probably the best forwards just to keep him around a little bit longer and see if you can solve this roster dilemma that the Mavericks have. But I've liked what I've seen from Pinson. I, I think that he he looks like a very competent player. Um, you know he's not a, you know he's not a offensive or defensive standout, but he's solid at both. And the Mavericks just could use a, another solid player. You know we we talked about passing and. Uh, creativity just a second ago, how the players who are missing are not really that. I've seen the- Theo Pinson make a couple passes that I thought, oh, yeah, that was nice. I, I want to say he averaged like four, four and a half assists his uh, college season. Actually, you guys might have brought that up on the uh, on, on your podcast. That, that might have been where I heard it. So those are the two I've gravitated towards. Um, Marquise Chris, obviously, I, I think has some use as well. Um, if, if he stuck around on the roster, I think uh, I wouldn't mind that at all. But I think it's Pinson and, and Knight that most stand out to me as as players who I think would play a lot down the, you know, throughout the rest of the regular season. All right, we're going to take a quick break and then we'll be right back with some more roster talk for the Mavs. This pod is brought to you by Prize Picks. Mavs fans, you've been hearing me tell tell you about Prize Picks for months. One of us, Nick or myself, have been talking about Prize Picks literally for months. Have you signed up yet? Prize Picks is daily fantasy made easy. If you have not checked it out yet, you're missing out. I'm telling you, you're going to love this app for the NBA and mix spots, pick them. Christmas Day is already over. New Year's Day is coming up tomorrow. It's going to be off the charts. Even more fun if you play Prize Picks. Prize Picks has, been, has the best NBA DFS prop game on the market. Prize Picks offers more NBA props than any other DFS prop operator and offers all the superstar players as well as bench players only recording a handful of minutes each game 
all of the users that deposit and use your promo code will receive a hundred percent instant deposit match up to a hundred dollars. Just to be sure, use the promo code MBA. You pick two to five players and over and under on the projections, and you can win up to 10 times on any entry, and it's just you and the projected numbers. Go to prospects.com today and use the promo code MBA or go to your app store and download the app. Prospects is daily fantasy made easy. Okay, when when it goes to like creating a roster spot. I know, you know, instantly we go to Trey Burke, but do you do you know anything about Willie? I mean, I I mean, I've just seen it on the you know personal reasons out for it feels like for a long time. If you don't, no big deal. But I didn't know if you knew anything about the Willie situation. I don't. I don't. Uh, honestly, I, I tend not to ask about those situations. If you know, assuming it's it's the answer I'm going to get back is well, here's what's happening, but you can't report it. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, there's there's I don't I don't need to know them. You know, like I, yeah. you know, so from what I hear, it's it's not close to being resolved. Um, I, I don't think he's going to be rejoining the team like tomorrow or something. And as as far as that goes, like really the only question is, you know, I believe he's making four million, maybe a little bit more than four million. That could be money that matches a trade that the team might be wanting to make nearer the deadline. And mm-hmm. at this point, that's kind of how I'm viewing him is that they could waive him tomorrow. They own that money um and, and he, it, he's he's not owed money beyond this season so that's that's the most immediate instant way to make a roster spot is just wave Colley stein but i i could understand if the front office has some slight hesitations for doing that because that contract for trade purposes could end up being useful uh at a later yeah. point and and i even say this as someone who thinks Colley stein is maybe a little bit unfairly slammed. Um, I mean, I get why, because his mistakes are large and looming and very visible. Um, The stats tend to say that the Mavericks tend to do well when he's on the court. Uh, But of course it's going to be frustrating when, you know, you don't, you don't see him switch onto a perimeter guy and and hold up. Okay. Um, That's not as, you know, those positives aren't as glaring, um, as him like missing an alley-oop dunk is. And yeah. that said, you know, I, I think that, you know, if, if you, if you, uh, if you drop him in Nat Chris, like what, you know, it's a wash. And Chris is someone who is actually going to be around the team as far as we can see. And, and, you know, without knowing the specifics on Willie's situation, um, you know, his, his availability right now is, you know, the whole availability is the, is the best ability. You know, the fact that he's not with the team right now when they're desperately needing bodies, uh, that's an issue. So, yeah. So going to back to one of your stories uh, you wrote, I think I think this is from Christmas Day. Um, You had a line in there. I'm going to do what I'm sure you and all other writers love is when somebody just pulls one sentence out out of context. But it's kind of sets up these next few questions for you. You said this team's roster and rotation will look different by March even if they can only spruce up the edges in their current situation. So we're in the midst of trade season. And if we just look at the roster, we look at what the Mavericks could possibly do. If I just say these three players, Christos Porzingis, Tim Hardaway Jr., Jalen Brunson, what are the odds that all three of those guys are on the Mavericks past the deadline? Ooh. I... I'm not even gonna make you pick you one. I just yeah, said I, know, I, know. I just said all three of them. Is it a high? Right. You can put a percentage on it that all three of them are on the roster past the deadline. These yeah, these questions are always so hard. Um, but I also ask similar questions sometimes to <laughs> you know when I'm doing the interview. So yeah, I've been on the other side. I, I totally I totally get why why you can plead you the fifth. Them. It's okay. I'll say let's say. Let's say 75%. Because I, I think, you know, you look at each player individually, and especially Chris Stops. I, I don't think that there are trades that really, you know, make sense for him. You know, I, I don't think that just because he's playing better this season doesn't mean that the biggest block to trading him, the money and the health concerns, have changed whatsoever. And I just don't think that's very likely to happen this season. And I think you look at Brunson and it's like, yeah, sure. Um, There is a scenario where you have good intel, you know, you, the the Mavericks have good intel that he's going to get offered X by X team this off season. And they just don't feel comfortable with that money. They, they, 
definitely in that scenario should be considering trading him or at least seeing what's out there. Um, if, if that scenario, you know, is true or if, if it, if it could be true, but at the same time, like, are you going to trade the only other playmaker on the roster, you know, unless you're getting a, an equal playmaker who fits as well or better with Luca in return? No. Um, Hardaway is someone who does seem more expendable. Uh, he has that declining uh, scale on his contract, right? So that yeah. makes it a little bit easier to trade him. Um, and and I, I would imagine there are contenders out there who are interested in a player like that for 20, 25 minutes a, a night. But I, you know, I, I guess what I'm trying to do is leave the door open, especially on, on Brunson, um, especially on Brunson in the specific context that I mentioned. And then especially on Hardaway, just more broadly. Um, that yeah. said, I, I just, I, 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 I don't think it's, I don't think the front office is set up to make huge moves at the deadline this year, I, I guess mm. is, is kind of where my hesitation to predict it's likely anybody moves. Um, so it's, it's a still like filling itself out type of situation. Right. Right. Yeah. And like, you know, whatever plans they have, like they had to pick up the pieces and, you know, it, it's not like, it, it, it's not like that, you know, it's it's not like they signed Hardaway three years ago and knew in his third year that this would be a, you know, the contract would be an option to be traded. You know, maybe maybe they signed him knowing that, you know, with the declining scale and his situation that he, he would be expendable as soon as the deadline. But in a lot of ways, you know, things happen very quick in the NBA, but they also happen over many years. And this front office hasn't had a lot of years to plan out and uh, scheme out exactly what they're trying to do. And so I, I think that something happens by the deadline. I, I think that, you know, there are things on the edges of the roster that that get changed up. Um, it seems pretty likely, you know, a, a Pinson or a Knight or a Chris probably ends up on the roster in some way. Mm. You know, I, I think that we've we've seen there's expendable people at, at the end of the roster. But um, it's a it's a bit too much for me to say like to expect a major rotation player to be gone uh, by March after the deadline. Yeah. All right. We're going to take one more quick break. We'll be right back talking about trade stuff. Guys, it is only fitting that the last ad break of the entire year of 2021 for Lockdown Mavs starts with Built Bar. An OG, one of our favorites out there. We're not even probably supposed to allowed to have favorite uh, partners out there, sponsorships out there, but Built Bar, they're near and dear to our heart. It's the new year, so that means New Year's resolutions. If yours is about getting fit, eating healthier, I know I got to eat some, I got to eat healthier until I was 22. Make sure you include Built Bar in your plan. I am, I actually am including Built Bar in my plan. Built Bar is a protein bar that tastes just like a candy bar, maybe even better than a candy bar. Built Bar makes it easier to stick to your resolution because it tastes so good you'll want to eat it. Unlike other protein bars that can be chalky, maybe waxy, tastes like a little chemical spill. Not Built Bar. You want to eat healthy, but it, it just gets so boring sometimes. Built Bars are covered in 100% real chocolate. Most Built Bars contain this. Check out this lineup here. 130 calories, 4 grams of sugar, 4 net carbs, and 17 grams of protein. Compare that to a normal candy bar which has around 240 calories, 30 grams of sugar, dozens of net carbs, not Built Bar. Built Bar is here to stay. It's amazing. We love them. Guys, the offer, go to Built.com, use the promo code, and get 15% off your order. Use promo code LOCKED15 for 15% off at Built.com. It's a great, great investment for the new year. I'm going to make a purchase myself right after the new year. I'm still rolling on the boxes that I have. Go to Built Bar. Go to built.com, use promo code LOCK15 for 15% off your order. Okay, some of the big names that have been out there in rumors. Sabonis, Miles Turner, CJ McCollum, Ben Simmons. If we just say those four guys, maybe even another bigger name out there, Jeremy Grant or whoever else. If you're like, hey, this is one guy that I'm watching. If the Mavericks decided to entertain something, this is the one guy I'd be like, okay, I wouldn't be shocked if the Mavericks went after him because of his fit in Dallas. I think it would, I think it would have to be one of the indie big men. And I think probably miles Turner. Um, if it's the bonus, I don't see how Chris stops is here. 
And, you know, probably to get one of these biggest names, it does involve trading Kristaps. So maybe that's not a concern at all. But, you think Rick would want uh, Chris Tops? Yeah, you know, like that's probably <laughs> not, right? So Chris you know, might want Rick. <laughs> I think I think that's probably the the bigger issue at play here. <laughs> <laughs> I it's it's tricky because like again, like I, I just don't think they really have the assets or or players or uh, expendability to to go get a bigger name. Certainly, they're not going to be in contention for Ben Simmons. Um, I don't do you think, think he would fit be... here. I know Mavs fans have been kind of like, Oh, if we do have a chance of Ben Simmons, some are like, No, nah, all out. Some would be like, Hey, we'll, we'll see how it fits. You, are you like all in, all out, or would you be like intrigued by it? I think he would instantly make this team better. I, I basically view him as he would replace Dwight Powell, mm. you know, like that's that, those are the minutes, that's the role. Like, imagine running back the starters, except Ben Simmons is playing the four. And Ben yeah. Simmons is the one setting screens. And it would take, once again, a little bit of, of you know, him buying into the role. Um, and that was something that led to a lot of the current conflict he has with, uh, you know, in Philly, to my understanding. But, but yeah, you know, if you bring him in as a screen setting, you know, middle of the floor passing uh, transition player who's playing the four, you can guard anybody on the other end. Absolutely. I think he makes this team way better. Yeah. Any update on uh, the Dragic situation in Toronto? I think, I think any update is, is purely up to Toronto. Um, mm. And I think it's them just kind of letting it play out and just making sure, you know, they, if he's on the roster and they just assume it's going to end up in a buyout, there's no reason for them to not wait until the trade deadline just to be sure. Right. Yeah. So, I, I I think that it's it's purely in their hands, and the moment they decide, okay, we are definitely not going to be able to trade him. And you know, if he was making two million or four million or even eight million, I, I think they probably could get something back for him. But I just don't know if other teams, you know, for for the way that he's valued as a player, I, I just don't think those teams that would value him on their bench have the money to really match. Um, you know that, and specifically that money's fully expendable because I think at this point, people are, you know, I think a lot, I think a lot of contenders are interested in Dragic. I, I think, you know, certainly there's curiosity about how he could uh, boost a second unit, but I, I don't know if his value is certain so certain at this point that anybody would trade for him, thinking for sure he's going to be part of like an eight-man playoff rotation. And because yeah. of that, you just aren't going to send the money back unless the money is completely expendable. And no contender has 18 million of completely expendable salary on their roster that that I can think of. You know, I, I, I haven't I haven't looked at every single roster. Um, please tweet at me and, and let me know if you see something that, you know, if, if a listener sees something that fits uh, and I may change the tune a touch. But I think I think that's just really the the stumbling block that has prevented him from being traded, and the fact that he's not playing for them, improving his value, um, and that he's thirty five, turning thirty six, I think in January. Um, yeah, it's just it's just not a good situation for Toronto to realistically be able to get something back for him. So you talk to different reporters, different people, different people with organizations, everybody around the league. When it comes to the Mavericks, we know how Donnie did things back in the day. It feels like, you know, some of the even the bigger things that happen, it just like, bam, it happens. Do you think this front office will be like that? Have you heard anything from other reporters, other people around the league? It's like, oh, well, no, they actually, you know, talk a little bit more than Donnie did, a little bit more either structured or basically just how different do you think this will be going into the trade deadline as far as rumors, potential deals, anything compared to the past regime? That's a good question. I, I think it was probably always a little bit overblown how tight of a ship the Mavericks ran. There, I mean, there was, I, I feel like there was always a decent number of rumors in and around them. Um, and, in you know, the rumors you get with like the Lakers or like really with deals that are in the process of being completed. Um, a lot of the, the times that's posturing that the Mavericks would happily do as well if they needed to. The, you know, one of the reasons the Kristaps trade didn't uh, leak before it happened was that the Knicks and the Mavericks pretty much instantly agreed to terms. And 
you know, yeah, to some, I, I do, I do think to some degree that the Cuban has pushed back really hard. He had that, you know, that, that one draft where he made everybody put their phones away or, or yeah. at least he said that I texted people in the room that day. So I don't know how <laughs> correct that was, but, you know, I, I do remember Cuban making a big deal about that one draft and, and certainly he, I, I feel like he tries to pride himself on, on the front office, not really leaking. Um, so, so I do think to some degree, like, yeah, they're in the upper echelon or they're, you know, but but sometimes rumors and things leaking is literally just how trades operate, and and it, it isn't it isn't about any team specific or how tight a ship. Like once you start talking to another team about a deal, it can leak. Like it, you have no control over it at that at that point. So yeah. that's it's a good question. Um, I, I think I, I don't I don't know. You know, I, I don't know if you know. I, I don't think that Nico Nico is new to the game. He's he's not going to be. I, I definitely don't view Nico as someone who's like strategically laying rumors and, and planning info in various places. Um, he is a very organizational, very structural uh, guy. Uh, I'll, I'll have something big on him in, in January. Um, Ooh, let's go. I like it. I like yeah, the yeah. 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 And, and, and for just the way that he is, the way that he's wired, um, you know, no, he's he's not going to be the guy spreading rumors all the way over. He, you know, he's he's very by the book, and I think that's a big reason why they hired him. Um, but yeah, I I I don't know, Isaac. I wondered. Uh, this answer has gone a complete full circle, uh, kind of around the question you're asking. Uh, either either fo- either point me in a specific direction that I didn't touch on, or or did that kind of answer it enough? No, no. Okay, tell me this. Take me inside of reporting as a beat writer as a guy that you work alongside shams we know you know shams you know breaks news and stuff all the time you've worked with him on stories before how does how is that back and forth like work how does you're like hitting shams i'm like hey i got this from my guy who's telling me this and he's like telling you the same thing you're like all right cool does our stories match he's hearing it from this side and then y'all like collectively do that together How, how does that whole like interweb work in reporting yeah, I'll talk very broadly here, but um, reporters, you know, all reporters are going to have different people that they trust, that they're tight with, that they can connect to. Um, you know, certainly as a beat reporter, I have more team connections um, than league connections. Um, let's say there's news and it involves a player and I don't know their agent, but there's a reporter I work with who does. Um, and I feel like the right thing to do is to reach out to that agent. I, you know, in the past, I have just reached, you know, I, I was at SB Nation before this. And, you know, sometimes I would just cold call a reporter um, or sorry, cold call an agent and be like, hey, I've heard this. I, I, I did that, you know, just a couple months ago about about something I broke. Um, sometimes that works. Uh, sometimes there's relationships. But, you know, yeah, once you start having colleagues that have relationships with people, uh, sometimes the best way is to loop them into stuff and, mm-hmm. you know, and so it's, it's a, it's a weird business. Um, years from now, I'd love to uh, be less broad about it and, and talk more about it maybe. Um, but it, it, it's, it's a, it's certainly a funny one. Um, let's, let me think. There. What? As you as you think, I was just yeah. saying, I respect your grind so much. And I was mm-hmm. just talking to somebody about this the other day, and I was talking about you specifically and just the the I want to say the lore, but the appeal of your job, how fun it would be to be on the inside and reporting these stories at basketball. And I'm like, guys, it would be fun. But man, a guy like Tim Cato, you're you know, you gotta be traveling, you gotta be, you know, plugging in all the relationships, not just maintaining relationships when you need something but when you don't need something and the time that you have to put in as a as a beat reporter and as a guy who reports on all these things it's a grind that i don't think a lot of people understand the grind that you go through one thing i'll say and and because we touched on it with collie stein um i try not to go out of my way to learn info that i can't use i i'm not like i don't try to just go bro chum up with people and tell me everything that's going on, but obviously I'll never, never say it or use it or in, in any way. Like, I just want to be in the loop. I don't feel like that's my job. Um, mm. Perhaps there are other people who go about it differently, but I, I try when, when I'm, you know, when I'm receiving information, um, 
yeah, of course there's stuff that I know that I'm not going to say. Um, and in, in the context, it makes sense for that. It, you know, this is an in entertainment industry and I try not to lose sight of that. Um, you know, like honestly, in a lot of ways, the whole scoops industry and the whole news breaking component of this league is something built up by the league itself. Um, because it adds to the entertainment value of the league. And so we do operate in that. And, and there are parts of this job, you know, uh, that feel, you know, don't feel as, as journalistic to me. And I, I try, I personally try to adhere to that. And that's, that's a big reason why, like, I'm not out here, you know, trying to, I, I don't, I don't need, if, if I can't report what, you know, just to use the example we have, what is happening with Kali Stein, no, I don't need to know it. Um, I might yeah. find out, you know, someone might tell me it might come up, but I'm not out here telling people, you know, asking people what's happening, what's going on just to like satisfy my own personal itch. Yeah. Um, you know, because I, 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 I don't feel like it's a healthy way for me to operate um, as much as I can. When I, when I talk to people, when I receive info, um, you know, I, I'm going to do right by the people sharing it. Uh, there's sometimes, uh, you know, there's an understanding I have with a lot of people I talk to about what is usable and, and how to present it. But basically when I'm having conversations, just like I'm trying to get to a point that the person trusts me, that anything they tell me uh, I'm going to use appropriately. Yeah. Um, you know, I may not use it or I may use it in, in broad terms or I may use it very specifically at a much later point. But, you know, both of us know, I, I you know, it's, it's, it's not being told me to, you know, share the, on Twitter, you know, an hour after I learn it, um, you know, like I, I knew that I knew that Boban Marjanovic was going to start uh, against the Clippers. I knew that early on. Um, I guess I could have tweeted it, um, you know, but that felt like a situation where, you know, it, it wasn't it wasn't going to be fair to any party in that thing. And and I will say Tyron Lue literally said, oh, yeah, they're, I think they're going to do that in his program presser. Clearly, the fact that I learned it meant that other people knew about it, too. Yeah. Um, but, you know, that was a situation where um, I thought the most fair. I was going to break it before. So I ended up breaking after Lue said it. I was going to break it a little bit before the game started. Um, but I thought that was like the fair way to approach a situation like that. Boban starting a game is not important journalism. Um you know, most stuff that happens on the court is not important in terms of like what the classic model of journalism is. And, yeah. you know, uh, you know, all the, you know, oh, what's the movie? All the President's Men? Is that, you yeah. know, the, all the journalist movies, you know, like because because it was info that was interesting and pertinent to my job, but also information that, you know, I thought I needed to handle fairly. You know, I ended up only tweeting it out after I saw that Lou did. And, and before that, I was going to, you know, do it you know, at some point, a little bit before the, the starting lineups came out. Um, so so that's try to, how, how I try to approach the job. And, you know, not to say, you know, I, I think I feel like I still learn how to how to kind of approach the job, you know, on a, you know, even even on a weekly on a daily basis, like I, I have a better understanding of what how I'm trying to operate in this sphere, um, which has its own rules in a lot of ways. But there's another rambling answer where I, uh, I love it on a lot. So, <laughs> okay. I have one last question for you. This is from the same piece and the, actually the same paragraph. And I just want to ask you, um, just how real, how close this was in your opinion. You said that's the best chance. I've obviously picked it up in the middle of a paragraph. That's the best chance for the Mavericks to put a better team around Doncic, not by hoping the coaching staff fixes them by being nicer, but by giving them more meaningful options to do so. This is in Cato's athletic story. I think on Christmas day, if not the two days after yeah, I get Christmas. the sit. Christmas? Okay. I get yeah. the sense Dallas knows this, to be fair. I don't think they had a meaningful past this offseason for more improvement. They really believe Kyle Lowry was coming before Miami emerged as a more attractive destination. So, it feels like we heard a similar thing about Kimba, you know, a few years before, maybe even a year before. Kyle Lowry. How real was this? Did, did Dallas really think that Lowry was coming to Dallas? I mean, I think you you look around the league and you looked at the the places he was tied to. You know, Dallas was the second best option. Like, you know, even even no no reporting involved in this whatsoever. I, I think I think coming to Dallas did make the most sense uh, up until Miami really became the sewer that they did. So, yeah, my understanding is they they really thought it was going to happen. I, I agree. You know, because you if if you finish second place in a free agency pursuit. 
doesn't that mean you're tied for last? You know, it's, it's very similar to the Kimba conversation where second place doesn't get you anywhere. Uh, the Mavericks have legitimately had a lot of things that were supposed to happen. Um, and as we look back through their free agency pursuits over the past decade, really, you know, like they thought they were going to get Darren Williams and Dwight Howard. Um, they felt like that is why they broke up the title team, um, because they thought those two players were coming in the in the summer of 20. That would have been the summer of 2012. Um but things change, and Dwight Howard decided to opt in. And then when it was just Darren on the table, uh, and when Brooklyn made some honestly bad player personnel moves, I think they get Crash Wallace. Do you remember that? Like, and then they, I want to say they re-signed Joe Johnson. Um, you know, that was enough to sway Darren back to Brooklyn. And, you know, it's very amusing to me that most of the players they've missed on or at least from, honestly, yeah, m almost all the players they missed on, like, they're probably better off that they missed. Yeah. Um, that's that's the that's the most, like, that to me is just still a very amusing aspect of this, you know, whole, whole conversation about chasing chasing stars. Not only were the Mavericks not good enough at actually signing the players, but the players they're signing or chasing, um, probably they shouldn't have signed and, and would have been out of trust contracts within a year or two. Um, but, yeah. I, I I do I do have an understanding that they really believe that they're going to get uh, Kyle Walker or Kyle, sorry I don't know is that the you just combined Kyle Lowry and Kemba Walker into one soul <sighs> that's what I did that's what I did <laughs> good uh, I'm so I'm going to take next it. off yeah. season I mean, Kyle, yeah. Kyle Walker will be a Maverick you heard it here first Kyle yeah. Walker will be a Maverick <laughs> but yeah I and mean, I will say Kyle man he would have fit here. No, so oh my God. Maybe he maybe the Mavericks pursuing him curse means that his body's going to break down, just like all the other players they pursued. But um, man, he's right here. All right, Tim, enjoy your time in Sacramento. I'm assuming you're staying there for the second game. Well, actually, no. The I'm not game. actually. No? I okay. So I have I yeah yeah. So they play New Year's Eve, and I'm very thankful that the Athletic gives me a fair bit of autonomy. Um, about my schedule and I looked at this trip and I looked at myself and I looked back at this trip I was like I don't want to I don't want to enter 2022 in the city of Sacramento no. <laughs> Marvin Bagley said the I, same I thing not, I just I just I couldn't do it to myself you know I would have <laughs> felt like Lady Bird um, so you're going so to LA I, I that would have been a a good second option but no I'm on uh, what's today? Wednesday. On Thursday, I'm headed back to Dallas. We'll uh, enter the new year home with some friends, and I think that's, that's the uh, the best thing for all parties involved. Well, you, as I've done this podcast with you uh, for the past thirty some minutes, I think you've looked more and more like Dirk as the the pod has went along with your beard and everything. So, and sometimes it it'll get a little like. <laughs> I've got, a, I've, got a, I've got a trim scheduled, but it's a winter beard. You know, I'm, I'm in cold weather. I'm allowed to, I'm allowed to retain heat. Yes, you are. Well, have a happy new year guys. You know, uh, if you are a mass fan, you're already following Tim list the 77 minutes at heaven. You have any uh, cool upcoming story that you can plug something. I mean, it is a big week coming up next week with Dirk and all. I'll have I'll I'll have something on Dirk. Um, I think if this podcast coming out on Brunson on the Athletic uh, Ooh, on Thursday, so that should be. I'm, see, I'm adding pressure to make sure I get it done today. I have <laughs> and I'm sure y'all it's going to be on our website. I'm sure, or some sometime around New Year's. I know there's one at Christmas. I know. Uh, I think it was last year. I gave the Athletic as a gift to one of my buddies. I'm sure that y'all have will have some deals going on around New Year. That if you want to sign up for the athletic, if you haven't already, you need to. By the way, you need to. I go to the athletic app literally almost every single day. It's like my go to for all the, it's so simple, it's so easy. I love it. So go join the athletic. But anyway, I appreciate it, Tim. I will, uh, I'll talk to you soon. Thanks.